Welcome everyone to another Voices with Raveki. I'm very excited about this. This is uh, the fourth meeting, more than a meeting, the fourth uh, deep discussion that often gets it close to Dialogos uh, with uh, my friend um, and uh, somebody who's taking us on a wonderful journey, Bishop Maximus. Uh, Bishop, it's it's wonderful for you to be here again. I'm looking forward for, to our conversation. I've been looking forward to it all day. Uh, thank you so much, John. I'm I'm really uh, enthused about being here, and I'm uh, well. I've been looking forward to this conversation uh, as well. Um, there's maybe a sense in which uh, this conversation is going to be the the climax of some of the things that we've been uh, yeah. talking about previously. Um, so, uh, well, let's uh, let's get at it. Um, I, I, you know, I, I've been, I've been listening to your um, series after after Socrates, and you've been talking about uh, dialectic, the dialogos, and um, you, you've been expositing some of these ideas, and you know, also showing some some practical ways to to make this happen. Um, and uh, now, of course, my perspective here is going to be. Uh, primarily from the Orthodox Christian yes. monastic tradition, or the, or the rather the the patristic perspective on on this, and um, it uh, well, it's not it's not just one thing. It breaks down into many many different aspects, uh, and um, I I think that these aspects, well, there's certainly differences. Uh, there's also commonalities mm -hmm. um so it's not uh i don't think this is just uh, a question of accept or reject or attack or defend oh yeah yeah um you know it's um i i think it's very much a question of of just looking at how things fit in or even you could say relevance realization <laughs> which i would say yes um <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I yeah, we ended last time, and thank you for bringing it up. What I was sort of saying, uh, for me, part of the project of uh, reinventio of the Socratic way, the Socratic Platonic, Neoplatonic way, but I'll call it the Socratic way, um, is uh, to uh, to rediscover these dialectical practices that lead to the process of dialogos and that for me converges very powerfully uh with the cognitive science about collective intelligence distributed cognition shared flow states um uh, collective rationality superseding individual rationality so there's a lot of cog psi that converges very powerfully uh with this uh with this socratic project um and so that's how I'm coming at it. Um, but I have been, um, you yeah, know, I think this is the right way of saying it. I've been increasingly impressed by the way in which you've articulated the transfiguration. And I think you've done a good job at um, uh, unfolding what that means, the transfiguration of Neoplatonism within uh, Orthodox Christianity. And so my question wasn't intended by any means as, yeah, as you said, I'm not... In, opening up a debate or making a challenge i wanted to know from that where where you know dialectic shows up um as a practice where dialogos shows up as something that people participate in i would call it a process but you might call it something else i'm uh, it's a very open question i want to know if the dimensions that i've been articulating uh with chris's help and guy's help and taylor's help um are articulated or addressed. I was, I, I have been astonished, and, and I'm not speaking hyperbolically. I'm reading uh, two books by a, uh, a, th a philosopher, a theologian that I've just been introduced to by Nate Hill, um, uh, Catherine Pickstock. One is uh, Philosophy After Language and the Liturgical Consummation of Philosophy. Um, and then the, uh, which, uh, and then this book that I'm reading now which I've, um, 
I put it in my top five up there with Religion and Nothingness and D.C. Schindler's uh, Plato's Critique of Impure Reason. It's called Aspects of Truth Towards a Religious Metaphysics, in which she's arguing for something. I, I like. I understand there's probably bias, but uh, I was even reading to my partner when we were away some passages and the convergence between her work and mine. She's obviously unaware of me. I was until literally days ago unaware of her around this um and she's i think she's a catholic christian um but this idea of these dimensions a horizontal and she uses the same metaphors that i'm using there's a horizontal dimension of you know resonating with other people there's a vertical dimension in which you're you're resonating with sort of levels of reality right and so there's vertical and horizontal participation and then they come in resonance to each other um, and what happens is people sort of move through stages of intimacy. There's intimacy with each other. There's intimacy with sort of a, a, the we space. And then there's intimacy through that with um, something much more fundamental, something like how the grammar of intelli the grammar of the mind and the grammar of reality share a profound conformity because they're both participating in something above them to use horrible spatial metaphors that I would like to challenge elsewhere, but <laughs> I'll just use them for convenience. Um, and so that's been, you know, encouraging to me that, um, uh, like, uh, first of all, I'm going to, I'm going to get her book on Kierkegaard and read it with Christopher Master Petro, just deeply impressed. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to take advantage of you because you probably have not had an opportunity to read this work. Uh, but I, I, I haven't, although you're piquing my curiosity. I, I, it, yes, I, I would love you to read at least the, the, the aspects of truth book. And you and I have a discussion about it. I think that would be, I'm not finished it yet. I, I'm working through it very diligently. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it, it made me, it made it very clear to me that, uh, you know, a profound, she is a profound thinker, a profound uh, philosopher, theologian, Christian um, was coming to a lot of convergence. Right Now, she wasn't specifically talking about um, dialectic as a practice, but she was unfolding this these dimensions of intelligibility and experience in a way that was so deeply consonant uh, with what I've been uh, talking about. So that's a very long way of saying, um, uh, you know, I, I, I was asking the question in that sense. I wanted to know where, like where, and again, you know, you, it doesn't mean that you're, you're authorizing or, or anything, but like, where is this kind of stuff showing up? Because, it seems that this is a proper dimension in which people awaken from the meaning crisis because people talk about discovering kinds of intimacy that are not sexual, that are not just friendship, that are nevertheless what they've always been looking for, but they didn't realize it. And that's almost like platonic anamnesis, right? There's something, they're, they're, it's inventio. They're both discovering and remembering this um, in a profound way. And it strikes me, if your proposal that Orthodox Christianity is transfiguring Neoplatonism, that it would have also addressed this dimension. And that's where the question came from. Well, um, as you said, it's a broad question. Yes. Um, so uh, let me try to Try to break this down into a couple different parts and we'll see how many parts we get to. Um, so one, one part is just the question of dialectic. Yes. And you know, what what is dialectic? How is it understood by the fathers of the church? And yes. you know, what aspects of it were accepted by the church? That's one part. And then maybe the other part, at least in, in my mind, the way the way that I think about the, these things was you know, when I when we were speaking last time and uh i was talking about some of my own personal yes experience and and uh analysis and approach of uh to to neoplatonism and how at the end i ended up rejecting dialectic as the let's say the means of yes of union with god um but the the process by which i went through um learning uh not just platonic dialectic but the the whole corpus of ancient greek philosophy which 
which um, uh, encapsulates uh, the dialectic that this uh, helped me to understand in a better fashion the fathers of the church who are talking about something slightly different, which would be um, something like theoria, contemplation. Yes, yes. yes. Um, and uh, the way that we have contemplation in the in the Orthodox Church, according to uh, the way that Saint Maximus develops it, and other fathers of the Church uh, develop it, and which I then incorporated into my own life, and in a way which, um, well, it it was it allowed me to to blossom or to to flourish in a way that that I couldn't. I wasn't able to before. Mm. Um, so, so the, the, those are kind of the two, um, the two poles that uh, I would use in order to approach the question. Um, now, if if we go, if we start with the dialectic, because that's the, you can say that's the first point, it's the starting point of the whole discussion here. Um, I, I think there's a, there's a framing issue that uh, we really have to address in order to have this conversation. Please. Uh, so, you know, it, it, the fathers of the church tend to make negative comments about the dialectic. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, they will, they basically will, um, I mean, in some of these dialect, some of these negative comments were directed towards um, some heretics who were using dialectic, like the Eunomians or the extreme Arians, who had this idea that God is perfectly comprehensible by by means of dialectic. Right, right. So they were attacking that idea of this perfect comprehensibility. You know, they said you can we can perfectly understand the essence of God, which is unbegottenness, and we can arrive at that perfect right. understanding through dialectic. Right, right. Um, which obviously is not what you're saying. No. Um, no. Um, and you know, there are also some some criticisms of the, you know, of of the Platonic dialectic. The the, the, the criticism, the the basic core criticism of the fathers vis-a-vis -vis dialectic is that it is not a sufficient tool to get us all the way up to God. Mm -hmm. Um Basically, because um, dialectic, of course, is the is the use of human reason, and um, when as human reason approaches the um, let's say the limit, the um, the grounding, the foundation, whatever whatever is behind and beyond and under and above, uh, you know, our reality as we as we experience it, reason breaks down. Uh, and is incapable of of expressing it, uh, or perhaps even incapable of accessing it, and and so the um, the the criticism of the fathers, the primary criticism, was that uh, that dialectic is doesn't have the ability to get us beyond that that line, as it were, um, by its, because by its very nature it's limited to what's within the you know the created world within within reality um of course we you know we say reality taonda in greek um and god is not included in that mm -hmm. uh so so the fathers of the church you know they they proposed a a different way of getting to god which was of course through uh through the purification of the soul through prayer and um, ultimately, the idea that that um, if we can't get to God through our own power, because there is a limit to what rationality can accomplish, then that means that in order to to be with God or to have union with God, that means that God has to come down to us. Um, and of course, that that occurs in its most uh, complete and perfect form in the incarnation of Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the incarnation of Christ being the, you know, the union, the the perfect union between God and man, between heaven and earth, between the created and the uncreated, between the intelligible and the sensible, 
you know, breaking down the middle wall of partition, St. Paul says, um, which can be understood in very, various ways, but, um, you know, it's the, it's the connection between God and man. It's also the, the, um, the model by which we, we understand uh, how reality is supposed to be. Uh, in other words, that, that things are not supposed to be in antagoni antagonism towards each other, or they should not be in an adversarial relationship, but they should be in a positive relationship with each other. And so this was expressed uh, at the Council of Chalcedon with the idea of the two natures of Christ and that the two natures of Christ are united. Uh, they used four adverbs, uh, without separation, without division, without change, and without confusion. Mm -hmm. And and so we, in, in the Orthodox Church, we understand this to be both a model and the, and the means by which um, all dualities, all, all dyads, are, are to be reconciled. Um, and so if you, then if you, all right, so you take that idea that this is the, this is the primary patristic idea vis-a-vis um, -vis dialectic, and then you re-look at dia a dialectic. Um, the problem that you have with dialectic is that Dialectic in the ancient world was not just one thing. There were different no. approaches to dialectic. It was yeah. used, the word was used in different ways. Yes. Um, you know, even within Plato, you have different mm. ways of using di dialectic. Um, you know, there's a kind of there is like there's a dialectic which which is heuristic, you know, which yeah. is a a debate essentially. Yes. yes. Um, and uh, you know that that aspect of dialectic was uh, somewhat promoted by Aristotle, um, and, um, well, it, it, it helped to serve to give uh, the dialectic a bad name. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, but, because people are understanding as adversarial. And logical. I mean, but Plotinus, in his treatise on dialectic, takes pain, and I talk about this in the series, takes pain to argue that it's, it's not primarily a matter of logic. That what he's talking about when he's talking about dialectic um he's talking about something that um has the the theoria aspect in it this way and has a transformational aspect in it this way um and so it's not primarily something between acts of speech it's 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 a way it's a set of practices for bringing about those sort of vertical and horizontal i'll use some of my language reciprocal opening um, but I, I don't think that's imposing on Plotinus uh, to, to no, to, to no. so all right so what I was trying to set up there was was why there's why in the Orthodox Church you can see sometimes a negative attitude towards yes dialectic. I understand that yeah okay um so all right so I want to set that up first before I go into the next part which okay is, please please which is which is why it's actually not as negative as it seems yeah. at first glance um <clears throat> so the, the the framing issue uh, is that uh, I think it's a uh, it becomes partly a question of of what are you comparing platonic dialectic to what is what is your reference point mm -hmm. and uh, from what I can see from what I can understand of your um, your 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 lectures your talks um, you are trying to promote. Uh, platonic or neoplatonic di dialectic um, as a healthier way of of um, using our well our, our our minds and our whole whole beings um, instead of the dominant mode of rationality which we have in our in our yes. modern world which is which is Cartesian ultimately in in its yes. derivation. Yes. Um, that, you know, that Descartes had this uh, idea of, you know, basically reducing everything to mathematics or, or the mathematical model. Um, it, so dialectic and reason becomes propositional, completely propositional. Yes. Um, all of the other aspects that you talk about, you know, the perspectival, the participational, um, these fall away. This becomes the model of rationality that dominates the, well, from the Enlightenment onward. Yes. Uh, and which has uh, which has caused 
so many problems in the modern world because we're just so focused on this one propositional aspect of rationality and, and we're ignoring all these other aspects. Right. That's, right. Uh, is, that, is that a fair appraisal? Yes, and, 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 and so the model there is much more the third way scholarship around the, you know, the, the actual Socratic Platonic dialogues, right? What's happening in there where um, the argument is not exclusive uh, or, or even to be prioritized over over the drama over the uh, over the perspectival uh, uh, interaction uh, over the appearance of aporia um, over the attempt to uh, follow the logos as it unfolds rather than to mandate it in as you said a monological universal mathemat mathematics or something like that um, so yeah, I, I'm I'm trying to get so a, a place where ra rationality is re-understood as ratio. We've talked about that, and it's understood as dialogical, and it's understood. Forgive, forgive me for forgive me for interjecting. In yeah. Greek, we would say orthos logos. That's the that's the phrase that. Um, well, that Aristotle and that uh, other ancient Greek philosophers ah. use the or, orthos logos. Orthos means correct, like we have in yeah. the word orthodoxy, correct belief. Logos, obviously, with its whole yeah, yeah, yeah. range of, of meaning. So it's the orthos logos, the 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 correct the correct reason, the correct relationship, the correct approach, um, is all encapsulated in this idea of, of of orthos logos. And I think what you're saying is really orthos logos. That's what we need to recapture. Yes. And, and I and I think that that orthologos is a proper proportioning and relation of your and my attention and what we're doing right now, not just the extraction of the propositions that we're uttering. That we are as that Socrates is as much talking about. Um, in fact, I think more creating, uh, enabling people to enter into right relationship to virtues and to each other. Uh, rather than op, op, he doesn't give definitions, right? He, he, in fact, he, 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 he invites them only to show how they need to be, how do they need to be transcended? Um, for me, I, I think that's exactly right. I, I think um, I'm trying to figure out how we can break out Ruchnik in, in his book, The Tragedy of Reason, beautifully as a section on how Descartes is actually hostile to logos and reduces it and replaces it rather deliberately with logic um, and a monologic at that. And I want to, um, and I, I think this is fair. Uh, I hope you find it fair. I want to recover the 4E logos, the enacted, embedded, extended, right? Uh, uh, embodied logos, um, and I and I don't want to do that in, in a fashion that's orthogonal to the Christian discussion of logos. Um, that, that I'm trying to show that in this series, and that's going to come out even more when we have the series within the series. And Chris and I do um, the relationship between Socrates and Kierkegaard as trying to bring out that discussion and give it a focal point. Um, so. I guess if I had to put it, yeah, I think you're exactly right. I'm trying to recover, but I don't want to recover it just in theory. I want to recover it in theoria. I want to recover it as something that has to do with how people are fundamentally proportioning their connectedness to each other and to the reality. That that, and um, I'm not making claims about that. That is a process. In fact, I'm, I'm making exactly the opposite. Descartes didn't like logos because it's messy, it's imperfect, it's indefinite, it's ongoing. Uh, he does all those things he doesn't like about it. Um, and that's exactly what I'm trying to recover and how that's a more proper notion of, uh, of ratio and logos. Um, I do think that the proposal that both cognition and reality are laid out dialectically um, which right, we can talk about that at some point. I think that is a profound um, idea that is also deeply explored um, in the Christian Neoplatonic tradition. Um, Kuza and Eregina are two people I'm going to talk about soon. In, in I couldn't talk about Maximus because I don't have I, I, the, my ignorance. I still need to know more. I still need to learn more. Um, yeah, well, that will take you about 20 years. 
No, no doubt, no doubt. <laughs> um, and and I gave a talk at Ralston. I don't know if you saw it about where I'm trying to, I'm trying to get, bring back, make respectable. I I, I saw that talk. Um, yeah. I, I I watched it actually. I I need to watch it again because um, you were you. You were trying to relate the le levels levels of intelligibility with right. um, of, of the world, and um, I, um, I I think there are parts that I didn't quite quite get, so sure. I need to sure. go over that. But um, yeah, me too. You I, know, I, I I agree with everything you're saying. Yes. Um, yes. Right now, and so my, my the point I'm trying to make here is that the. When the fathers of the church were speaking negatively about dialectic, they were they were speaking negatively about it vis-a-vis -vis its what they viewed as its excessive claims to be able to to accomplish union with God. Um, yeah, <laughs> that, that was that's their central crit criticism. Um, however, the the fathers of the church did accept dialectic. For everything that was below that, yes, um, which is which is a huge, a huge range of you know yes. everything practically. Well, you know everything that is part of reality. So, so you have you have in the fathers of the church you have the, um, uh, well a, a use uh, an acceptance of, um, well the the components of of platonic dialectic you know of the there's the collection and division you know there is the abstraction there's the uh there's the intercommunication um there's the there's the logic you know you have then you have all of aristotle's categories and the ways that these work out you know the the ammonian categories and um all of which kind of entered into dialectic or or had a relationship with it and you know this was all accepted by the church the um so so the question here really um is uh what 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 are we using dialectic for and what is its uh what is what is its uh purpose and and what are we relating it to so from the orthodox point of view if we're if we're if we're trying to let's say replace christianity with dialectic then we're not going to accept that part i get that um but if we're going to um but if we're going to use it as a as a corrective to the the excesses of the cartesian model well then it's not not only is it a is it a good uh approach i would say that it is it is a necessary approach that rather or in an indispensable approach yes and so you know i think the, the way that the way that um of course we, we we think of christian civilization and it's uh you know reducing it to its simplest elements it's the it's the fusion the combination of the the biblical part and the greco-roman heritage um you know the particularly the the philosophical part um and these were they came together uh, and you know we spoke a little bit previously about how they came together slightly differently in the Easter yes. in the East and in the West. Yeah. Um, but in both they did they did come come together. Um, and so in uh, ultimately in both the East and, and the West, the 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 things that you're talking about, the the dialectic and all all of its components and the 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 Arabos that you are yeah. um trying to have proceed from it um these were all accepted as a basic part of education um and so and i mean this is how i would look at it and i think this is how I, how most um orthodox theologians would look at it is that uh dialectic is a as is, is an integral uh an indispensable element of what you could broadly call the classical education, um, and and that it is something that everybody who's trying to develop themselves ought to learn uh, and ought to 
practice actively to the extent that they're capable of, of doing so. Obviously, everybody has, has different levels of interest and different uh, capabilities. Um, but, um, you know, like if you read Plotinus' uh, essay on, uh, on dialectic in his mm -hmm. Aeneid, um, I mean, it's a beautiful little treatise. It is. Uh, it's, it's very beautiful, and there's nothing, there's nothing unchristian in it. Um, you know, he, he's talking about the, uh, I mean, perhaps the emphasis would be not quite the same emphasis that we, that we would put. And, and certainly we know that at the end, the, the goals or the claims are going to be different. But just when he talks about the process itself, uh, you know, and, he's, and he's, he talks about, of course, abstraction, the whole point of uh, collection and division and gathering in order to um, be able to, to understand uh, the forms, uh, to be able to, to go from, uh, you know, a concrete good action or some particular beautiful thing to that which is to the beautiful itself, to the good itself, you know, to the true itself. Um, you know, Plotinus explains that this is a, this is a central part of, of what dialectic is and the contemplation of, of this is what helps, is what elevates the mind up to, up to higher realities and which allows a person to transcend uh, not just transcend this physical world, which of course we, we would say that the Platonists uh, overly denigrated the body um, or matter, but um, but to but to elevate a person spiritually so that they can um, progress in in virtue. Um, so you know there is this idea that you have in the uh, in the Fathers of the Church, like Saint Maximus says it says it explicitly that. That in order to overcome the passions, um, or we could say the vices, or we could say sins, it's all mm. part of the same um, category of problematic behaviors and attitudes, uh, which we which we all have. It's it's not just enough to reject it. Uh, it's not just enough to to not want it. He says that you you need to have a higher contemplation. Um, yeah. Something you need to have something better to replace it with. Otherwise, you're just never you're never going to do it. I agree. I think um, right. So so these so this uh, you know so the, the the dialectic insofar as it ascends upwards and gives us a contemplation of of higher goods and ultimately higher higher virtues. Um, this actually has the practical effect of of um, giving us the tools to to overcome vice and to acquire virtue. So it's not, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's as I think you're trying to, to do in, in, your, in your talks, in your program, um, you know, it's not disconnected from life. Uh, rather, it's very much integrated into our, our um, our, our practical life and our attempt to to be virtuous. I think that's well said. Oh. Uh, maybe I could interject at this point and, and say a few things in response. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, that uh, reframing was extremely helpful. So thank you for that. Secondly, I would, and I don't think you're going to disagree with this. I would say that, that those processes, those movements should not be understood as abstract conceptual moves within a taxonomy, the, the division and the gathering together. For me, this is much more a uh, theoria. It's much more phenomenological and attentional in nature than it is just abstraction in a purely conceptual sense. It, it's very much about learning to, like, uh, you know, like I talk about, you know, you meditatively break things down and you contemplatively put them back together. And it's a phenomenological shift. It is not just, like I say, just a logical process. And, and that's what, that's what I think, I would argue that's what Plotinus is objecting to in Aristotle. He's objecting to, to, he's objecting to Aristotle, making it a matter of propositions rather than a matter of attentional uh, transformation. Yeah, I, he, he, he pretty much says that explicitly. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I, like, part of what I'm trying to do is recover 
the phenom- look, we can't even say the words analysis and synthesis without thinking of them in Cartesian mathematical terms. I'm trying to help people recover a non-mathematical theoria sense of those as something you can practice so you get a phenomenological disclosures of sort of the ligaments of intelligibility for yourself. And it goes from being things you think to being events you realize and processes you participate in. And I think that is a very important thing I'm trying to do. Um, uh, just like, like if I could just get people to replace sort of the conceptual Lego model that you get of those terms with a contemplative zooming in, zooming out and moving from different perspectives uh, way of doing it. And, and here I, I'm, I'm helped by, you know, the work I do with Dan Schiappi and John Rusin and others about trying to integrate Plato and phenomenology back together again. Um, I guess the reason why I'm, I, I, I'm saying that is because for me, there's a horizontal aspect to this too, which is, and here I'm trying to capture some, and we, we have an episode around this uh, coming, Buber's notion of the I thou, right? That part of what we're doing is, is learning how to not conceptualize, but to like to, Alethea, to recover, to right, to discover, to enter into the I thou mode with other people and remember it, and, and which is very similar to remembering the distinction, remembering sati, the distinction between the being mode and the having mode. And I think there's deep connections between the being mode and the I thou. And so for me, that horizontal I thou is also an integral part. And that, of course, is captured very clearly in the Socratic dialogues, mm -hmm. in some of the metaphors that Socrates uses for himself. He compares himself to a midwife helping people to give birth to themselves, right? And so that that's clearly a profound I-thou relationship uh, going on there. And I think that horizontal dimension of the I-thou and then the vertical dimension that we've been talking about here, uh, I think recovering them and then realizing them and then also realizing how they have this they have an they have an uh, they have a like uh, they have an affinity affordance of each other they are affined such that they afford each other the the more this is happening the right the more this becomes possible and vice versa and i think that has to do with sort of truths about perspectival knowing and participation and, and etc so i just wanted to i just wanted to say I'm giving a phenomenological reading to what Plotinus is doing in that vertical. And then I'm also trying to give this, I don't know what, Buber always resisted all the labels, right? He wouldn't call himself a philosopher or a, theo a theologian or an existentialist or whatever, uh, but that that horizontal dimension that Buber emphasizes. And what do you think about that? Does that land well for well, you? Well, I, I, I agree. I agree with it. Um, and and um, uh, I guess, not only do I agree, but I think that it's part of a necessary correction to, to the, um, uh, the whole world framing that we have right right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think it's a it's a necessary, absolutely a necessary framing. Now, uh, maybe I think of it in slightly different terms than than you, although I think they're convergent terms. I I think of it in terms of recovering a classical education. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, I, in terms of of this, the the dialectic, dialectic in the positive sense, yeah. not heuristic, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not not an argument where I'm trying to beat you down and I'm trying to win, um, but um, but a, uh, a a positive relationship where ultimately the the result is uh, a growth of both aspects. Now, now, I mean, we can apply that in different ways because, you know, there, there, there's dialectic and there's dialogos, right? Yeah, um, you cannot, you you cannot know, do dialogos. Uh, like, I, I, like I, I keep emphasizing that. Dialectic is a thing you can practice that conduces the possibility of dialogos occurring. But if you if you think it is something you can do or make, it's like thinking you can you can one-sidedly run a conversation or one-sidedly make someone your friend or any, like the, it is something you can you you for me and this is an important dimension of it you can only participate in dialogos and it is a proper way of realizing participation in a non like other and then in, in something other than just a conceptual philosophical 
sense. It is about actually, oh, this is what participation is. This is, it gives me a deeper understanding, the non-propositional understanding of what participation is. And that's why I insist on, yeah, you know, dialectic is something you can do. It's a practice, you know, and therefore you, you, you teach people to do it. But the process of dialogos, if it doesn't, is it, if it doesn't, if it doesn't self-organize and take on a life of its own, um, then it's not dialogos. It's just not dialogos. That's what I mean by it. Like if you if you uh, try to, to my mind, and I think I think I, I, I like I, I, you're not resisting me or anything, but I, like I would really defend this, right? Um, if dialectic is not allowing people to participate in participation, if that doesn't sound silly, then we've lost something from the Platonic. We've lost something that Plato was emphasizing, right? Uh, you should be, you should be. Dialogos should be you inventio, deep, profound inventio of participation as a profound reality for all of those involved. Uh, well, I I agree. Um, you know, I, again, I I how you can say that I have I have nothing against the you know the program that you're that you're laying out because I'm. Basically, the way that I'm viewing it is, is the uh, expression of the classical education yes. of yeah. you know of of uh, Plato and you know integrating elements of of uh, large elements of Aristotle, but in a more Platonic framework, um, and then integrating into that, that some of the modern advances in cognitive science, totally. uh, which I don't think, you know, which I don't think contradicted at all. I think they right. enrich it rather. Um, and, you know, there's certain, uh, certainly nothing objectionable in that enrichment. Um, so, so, you know, the, 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 the way that I see this is, is, is basically the, the, uh, how can I say? I don't want to say adaption. I want to say the the um, the application or the reintegration of the the of of the classical education with the with genuine advances of the modern world that yeah. we can't ignore. Um, you know, because we don't want to be just uh, you know romantic dreamers no. um or or try to you know recreate a mythical past that probably never really existed in the way the way that we imagine it um uh but genuinely taking what what is uh valuable from from the wisdom of of the ancients which is tremendous in its uh in its scope and in its truth and in its beauty and uh using it in the modern world in in order to to have a correct orientation we can say in orthos logos um the you know you use what you use um you know the recta ratio recta religio these yes. um yeah, yeah. Term, latin terms which you know are they mean the same thing as the greek yeah. um you know because because we've gone way too far in in another direction so I I totally agree with that. Uh, not only do I agree with that, I, I I think it's indispensable for the world. I I I I honestly don't see how we can have any kind of real correction of the of the fundamental problems that we have in in the world today without some sort of a return to the um, these basic elements. Uh, of let's say we could say philosophy, dialectic, reason, understanding, logos, however you want to express it, um, without without uh, reintegrating them into our understanding of the world. I don't think that it can be done without it. Well, thank um, you for saying that. I think that's and yeah, and so to the extent that you're that you're trying to promote this and also you know obviously integrating um, some modern cognitive science into it. Uh, I think that uh, not only is it a good project, it's an indispensable project. So, 
so in in that sense uh you know i i completely agree and uh yeah. you know i'm i'm thoroughly uh you know thoroughly behind you <laughs> well first of all thank you for saying that i thought that was very uh, both very careful uh, and generous and uh also supportive in a non-trivial fashion um I wanted to ask you something that I didn't get to bring up in this series, and it strikes me that you are the right person to talk to it, about it. Um, uh, the, and it goes back to your your point at the beginning about um, the negative view, because there's a sense in which God has to come down. <clears throat> and I wanted to ask you something, and I know you probably won't ultimately agree, but I want to hear what you think about it. Because um, you probably know I've been profoundly influenced by Tillich. Now, of course, Tillich comes out of the uh, the Protestant tradition, <laughs> and I get that, but he is also deeply influenced uh, by non-Protestant sources and even non-Christian religions. So um, I don't, uh, he, he uh, I mean, I think it's fair to say that Tillich is a, is a very non-traditional Protestant in a lot of ways. Um, That's definitely fair to say. Yeah, yeah. and I think his God beyond God, uh, that the God beyond the God of theism, uh, I think is, is very similar to a lot of things you've said. Not identical, but I think um, similar. Why do I bring Tillich up? Because Tillich had this idea, and I and I didn't put it in the series because it's something I'm just thinking about. So I'm really just like, let's talk about it. Right? He had this idea of a dialogical relationship, right? Where uh, where human beings can't they can't command or generate, and this is also some of the negative versions of theurgia. They can't manufacture or manipulate revelation in any way. I'll just use his terms. Right. Mm -hmm. But what he said, we it's not just simple imposition from God. He thought it was a dialectic or a dialogical relationship in that uh, what human beings can do. And, and you'll see why I, I, this is so Socratic. Hum, what human beings and human reason broadly construed the way we're construing it, because I think that's also what he was doing. They can form the questions that help to properly frame how we could receive the revelation um but we, we we can form the questions we can't get the answers but of course answers can't exist un unless there are questions that have been posed if i can put it that way and so he thought the relationship even there that you were talking about might be understood uh dialogically now um and you of course you you don't you don't have any worries about synergism we've talked about that uh before yeah, i would say yeah that just popped in yeah as soon as yeah. you said that i was thinking to myself it's synergy. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's a dial. And for me, this is, I mean, this is so Socratic, right? Because at the core of Socrates is the questioning quest the, or the questing questioning that is trying to make you receptive to something that you can't generate on your own. And I was wondering if you thought that there's even a way, and if you reject this, that's fine. We're friends and I, and I like our friendship a lot. But if there's a way, uh, you know, I, I've been thinking about this, about, but maybe even that relationship, it can, it can be properly understood as dialo dialogical, dialogical, synergistic in the way I was just saying um, that, um, well, that's it. I've explained it. And what, do, like, what, 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 what lands for you? What, what does that evoke or <laughs> possibly provoke in you about it? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what just immediately comes to mind. Uh, which is that, first of all, for Christians, prayer is dialogue with God. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Dialogos, um, maybe in the most profound sense. Uh, and um, it goes both ways. It has to go both ways. Right. Uh, and, you know, we believe, or rather we, we experience, that to the, to the extent that a person grows in, in prayer, uh, that the that the dialogical element increases um and in other words you know when you first start start out praying it often feels like it's a monologue yes um yes you know and for many people it's like you feel like you're talking to a wall um but when you when you work through that and um yes. we, we we understand this not in isolation because for us it, it has to take place in the you know in the context of of the um, the mysteries of the of the church we use the word mystery instead of sacrament yep. um which by the way to use your terminology 
mystery indicates a transjective relationship. Yes, yes, yes. Um, the you know purification, the purification of the soul, which is which is necessary. The you know the acquisition of virtue. Uh, how can you say? It? As you've also repeated many times, a a, a truth which we uh, also emphasize. You know, there's not just one thing that you do that solves everything. Right. There, there has there has to be um, there has to be a whole world of of beliefs and practices and attitudes. Um, you know, which which all together uh, help to proper properly orient us and ultimately to help us to to participate to participate in in God. Uh, so. You know, we, when we talk about prayer, uh, we we do think of it as a as a dialogue, properly speaking. And to the extent that we grow in prayer, the dialogical element increases, increases because we become increasingly cognizant of the of the presence of God. Um, now, you know, and that that presence of God can be can manifest itself in in, in different ways. Um, obviously, there's an there can easily be an element of self deception, of course. Involved. Yeah, um, yeah. you know, and you know, how many people say, God told me to do this, or you yeah. Know, yeah, 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 God yeah. told me to do that, you know, it was the spirit that led me to do this, you know, and it's like the spirit led me to buy a blue car, you know, it's um, it's just that's just the the imagination itself yeah. projecting. Yeah something um and it's ultimately a form of delusion uh which is why as you often mentioned we need wisdom in order to be able to yeah. discern yeah. Yeah. uh between yeah. truth truth and error uh not just propositionally but but actually in yeah. in practice as well so um so the first thing that comes to mind is is that is the is prayer prayer as as dialogue or the dialogos which yeah yeah because yeah. because we, we understand we understand this in terms of like you know as levels basically in the Dionysian sense you know we have these three levels of of the spiritual life we have the purification we have the illumination and we have the the deification yeah uh you know to the extent that one grows as I said it becomes becomes more dialogical and then by at the same time it's syner synergistic yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, because uh, well, how how could it be otherwise? Mm. Um, I mean, if if it's not synergistic, then then it's then we're just, you know, what are we puppets? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, are we just God's playthings? Um, you know, not not to mention the you know the worst the worst uh, directions that that kind of logic can go into, where you end up with things like double predestination and mm -hmm. God creates people for the sole purpose of damning them to hell and they have, they can't do anything about it. I mean, just like, like horrible distortions of Christianity that people have actually believed. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we, we have to have synergy. Otherwise there's, um, I mean, within, if there's no synergy, there's no meaning. Let's put well, it that way. Well, well, I made the argument, uh, you know, there, if there's no synergy, there's no participation, right? Um, and, and and I think prayer, I hadn't given enough thought about this, um, but prayer follows the model. I would like if you try to make it from a one sided that that's where you're going to get a lot of the egregious deformities that you're talking about. Like 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 uh, granted, people will start monologic, but they they have to undergo significant transformation where. It's not something they're monologically making. It's something they're dialogically participating in. Um, uh, and I think, uh, you know, I, well, I, I agree, but I, I, I think that that dialogue or dialogos can, I, I can you say, like many practices, uh, you have to go, you have to grow in it and you have to right. go through, right. through steps. And, and I think that sometimes for many people, um, the logos starts out somewhat monologically. Of course, I, I wasn't um, criticizing that. I, yeah. I, I, I well, was... well, because you you can see it in Plato. 
you know, yes, look yes. at how many how many of Plato's dialogues are Socrates just asking questions and the other person just says, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I agree, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, is that a dialogue? I, I mean, when the other person just says, yes, 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 yes. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think that's what you're looking for um, in your dialogue. Dialogue was just yeah. you're you know you're talking to the other person is just nodding and saying yes 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 yes. Um, but it's the it's the beginning of a dialogue. Yes, it's the beginning of a of a of a dialogue. So so there's a beginning that starts kind of monologically, um, but as it grows, it grows into the, to the dialogues. That, that's exactly what. Um... I wanted to emphasize that, that that growth is something you can't make happen. You have to commit yourself. To, you have to cultivate it, to use, a, 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 um, I, I think, a good metaphor. I, I, I don't mean to tr trespass upon you, and we, we are running out of time, but <laughs> when it becomes... I'm 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 ask. I hope you consider me a friend. I'm asking this as a friend. I, I do. I do, John, it, very much. Good, good. Um, what is it like, like in a really profound meaning of that, almost like what's it like to be a bat? What's it like when prayer becomes dialogical? What does that mean? And I, I and, and I understand, I understand all the important caveats. There's the, there, you can, you could be confusing it with projection. You could be engaged in self deception. Let's say that nevertheless, there are clear times when the, the wisdom, the discernment is there, the theoria, you can see into the depths of things, and it becomes dialogical. How does that, and I don't want to just use the word experience because that's too, that's too Cartesian and limited, but how does that, what is that like? I can't, yeah, I can't put it in a, I don't want to put it in other terms because the other terms are going to be insulting or reductive. I'm just trying to give you this open-ended question about, I want to know. I want to understand. Um, and and if you uh, don't, if if that's a question no. you don't want to answer, I I I'm fine. Well, it's a it's a profound question, um, or maybe it has a a, pro, a profound answer uh, because it's it refers to something um, so deep within the human soul. Um, the as I said, there, we understand there to be three. We use the model. I, I'm not saying that this is the only way to look at it, but we use the Dionysian model of yeah. of purification, illumination, and and contemplation. And we understand that the that the interaction with God, or we could say with God's grace, which of course the Orthodox Church we're understanding as His energies. Um, so actually, God, not some sort of intermediary. Right, right. Um, that this increases to the extent that we that we grow, uh, that we grow spiritually, and so the um, let's say the the true we can we can experience little bits of it on a lower level, and I think a lot of people, maybe, maybe most, maybe most sincere Christians have experienced a little bit of it from time to time. When they're praying and they they can feel that God is somehow there with them, um, you know that's just that's like a tiny little taste, a drop mm -hmm. of of what the the actual experience of um, I guess what you what you would call dialogical prayer, mm -hmm. um, the where. Uh, it can manifest itself in 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 different ways. Uh, certainly, we would we would refer to it as the, the the presence of God. In other words, the presence of God in a in a way that is absolutely real that cannot be confused with a feeling or a mental projection, where you you have the perception of God being there, you know, just as I perceive you, John, being there and I'm talking with you and I, you know, your presence is there, of course, intermediated by the yeah. technology, yeah. which is, which does reduce the level of presence. Yes. Um, yes. You know, if, if we were in person speaking, of course, we would feel, we would both feel each other's presence yes. more 
more intensely and more dynamically. Um, but um, so 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 that that sense of presence of is becomes becomes more apparent, uh, more manifest. Um, and then the you know the the dialogical element. Um, I guess it's it, of course it's usually not in the sense of words, right? No, no, I get um, that. It, um, not that that never happens. Uh, we we most certainly believe that sometimes God can actually say words, um, but that's not the usual way that that uh, it happens. Rather, it is a there there become there is a deep understanding of what of what is our relationship to God, what is God's let's say God's providence for us and for the whole world, then and what is our relationship to to the world um, understood within within the framework of God and this kind of gets to the contemplation of the logi according to Saint Maximus. Um, and so the how can you say that the dialogical element comes in not so much in the sense of you know I'm saying one thing and then you're saying yes. another thing and we're yeah. going we're going back and forth but rather rather in the sense of of understanding and participating immediately in all these relations mm. um so you know what you what the term that you use the tra transjectiveness or the transjective re relationship uh which I which I like that term um you know uh, this this is becoming present and we're actually participating in it so so i think it's you know what what you talk about you know you talk about in the in the dialogues between two people and yeah, um yeah, yes. you know how you're how it's not it's not just that you're using a technique in order no. to yeah. to you know just to go back and forth you're 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 trying to you're trying to manifest or participate in something that's a little bit that's larger, maybe that's even yeah. greater than some of the than the sum of its parts. Um, and um, you know, you would probably, I assume that you would relate that to ideas like flow. Um, yes. uh, you know, so so basically, and and of course, that's where you're leading with the with the dialogos, right? That's yeah. you know, the, the dialogos is not just is not just there for itself, because there's a there's a lot. There's something larger. Yes. Um, that's, that's that's appearing within that that framework. Well, in in prayer, I mean, in in, in true prayer, uh, what, what you would call dialogical prayer, even though we you know we don't really use that phrase, um, it's that's kind of like what's happening. I see. Except on the wider scale, because it's not just you and me. It's it's me and everything. Right. Yeah. The, does that make does that make sense? It does. It does. That was very helpful. And and you made me reflect upon that I need to do a little bit more reflection on the deeper connections between the phenomenology of and I don't mean just the of the appearance. I, I mean it in a deep sense, like Marlo Ponti's sense. The phenomenology, the relationship between the phenomenology of prayer and the phenomenology of dialogos, because I think the way you're you're it's it's it, it's odd to me that I never thought to I you know to make that connection very clear, uh, but I I want to thank you for bringing that out. I want I, I need to think about this. It's it, it's okay. very thought provoking to do it. I'm very appreciative of it. It's very juicy. I'm going to need to wrap it up for today, uh, but we of course are going to talk again. Um, and it's. Um, well, it's, you know, and we had no problems with technology this time. We were just very smooth, and um, I really enjoyed this. Con I've, oh, I've I've enjoyed all of our discussions and the way they get to this other place, um, and and the way they, they 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 sort of become enacted symbols. They tend to point beyond themselves in powerful ways. I just really appreciated this, and I found this one really, really, really rich as always. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Well, I, I thank you, John, for the opportunity to to talk about these things and and you know there there is dialogues going on because yeah. um you know it's it's not just you asking me questions and me giving you answers um you know there's you you are um 
the 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 interaction between the two of us is something that causes me to to think and to and to grow. I hope I hope um, I believe and um, you know I think that this is uh, well I would I would express it um, in terms that probably you wouldn't use, but uh, hopefully that you understand that this is uh, um, that it's that it's God's will and. Um, that it is a uh, part of the means by which God uh, helps me, maybe you, um, yeah. uh, grow in grow in in wisdom. I hope and understanding, and in ultimately in what we would um, what you would call the the proper perspectival relationship. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I mean, this is we didn't really get to it, but um, ultimately, this refers to the perspectival level. Um, oh, oh, totally, that sense of presence. That's 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 the right. that, that's the criterion of realness for, within perspectival knowing is that sense of presence that you were putting so so much of an emphasis on. I think I think that's exactly right. So so thank you, thank you, John, as always, for the opportunity to to speak with you. Thank you very much.